Hello and welcome back to chapter 8. In this chapter we're going to talk about the malleability of memory, the processes of forgetting things, editing information, and distorting information in our memories. All right well let's get started. This is going to be quite the film festival chapter so brace yourself for lots of videos embedded into the playlist. Okay, so first off, let's just start by identifying the seven sins of memory. And then one by one, I will break them down and um, provide more information about each one. So first off, there are, there's the sins of omission. Those would be the sins that include leaving something out. Um, so that would be um, described by something called transience, where we lose access to the memory over time. And so when we go to retrieve it, we can't get it back out. Absent-mindedness would be another sin of omission where we fail to encode information due to a lack of attention to the information. If you recall back in our discussion about transferring information from short-term memory to long-term memory, um, encoding requires attention. And so if we fail to pay attention, we will fail to encode. And then the last sin of omission would be blocking, which is a temporary inability to retrieve the information. It's in there, it should be retrievable, but something right now is preventing us from retrieving that information. Now the sins of commission would be including something that is incorrect. So you're actually committing an error here by including something that shouldn't be there. Um, so let's start with the sins of omission because as you might have noticed, we have more of those. The first one being encoding failure. All right, so uh, just to remind you, in case you forgot from way back, um, you know, we have sensory memory stores and uh, those memory stores are present in each of our sensory organs. So you have a, sen a sensory memory in your eye, in your ears, in your uh, touch sensation, not as clearly in your nose and in your mouth, because when you have um, chemical senses like smell and taste, it's harder for uh, sensory memory to be formed. Um, so let's imagine that these red circles that I carefully placed here in a not very <laughs> organized fashion, um, each of those red dots, let's imagine, um, represents some bit of information that's, that's being held in, you know, one of our sensory organs. So that that's all the information out in the world that's being currently held by our sensory organs. The short term memory store would contain those items that are noticed and then encoded into short-term memory. And so now that's going to be a smaller set of the information that was out in the world, right? Um, our long-term memory is going to contain um, those items that were paid attention to enough that they actually got moved from short-term memory into long-term memory. And so some items are going to get lost in that process. Some might get altered. So see, I kind of squished them in that one. So they're a little bit altered. Um, so as we go through the stages of memory, if we're going to follow the, you know, um, Atkinson and Schifrin modal model of memory, um, by the time you get to long-term memory, there's just a small subset of all the things that had been out in the world, right? That loss of all that extra stuff is what we call encoding failure. We didn't pro process it deeply enough to transfer it into our long-term memory. All right, so let's see how that plays out in a real world example. Um, all of you who, are in the US have seen a US penny. This is actually a set of um, set based on you know the original, well I don't know if it's the original penny, the 1900s, <laughs> probably 1950 to probably 2010 version of a penny. All right, so you've all probably seen you know hundreds of pennies in your life, if not more than that. So it should be really easy for you to recognize the one that's correct and reject all the ones that aren't. So usually in class, I ask students, okay, which ones can we really easily reject first off? And usually we'll reject the um, examples L through O because we all know he's not facing to the left. So we're like, okay, so it's not those. Okay, so now what else can we easily reject? And people will offer different things. They'll say, well, we should get rid of the one that says, in God we trust at the top. And then other people will say, no, 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 that's there. Um, or no, it shouldn't say liberty there. Yeah, no, no, that belongs there. No, it says e pluribus unum. They like they'll get a little argument. That one cent belongs there. No, it doesn't. Um, so there'll be a little argument, and then we ultimately reveal that, of course, if you've gotten a penny out while we've been talking, the correct one is penny A, and you can retrieve an older penny and confirm that that is in fact what it looks like. Okay, why do we argue about it? Why are we unsure about this question? Why don't we really know? 
Well, even though you've seen hundreds of pennies in your life or thousands of pennies in your life, you don't really pay that close of attention to them. They just are, right? You just don't look at them that hard. So you don't encode those details into memory because they just really don't matter, right? So you just don't pay attention to them. Um, that's one of the biggest sources of forgetting is that we just never encode the information. So how about some other common objects that we never encode? Think about a classic phone, not your cell phone. The cell phone keypad is different. Think about a normal, you know, older timey phone. Um, all of the numbers have letters on them corresponding to the numbers. But to, I'll give you a hint. There are two letters that are missing from the classic phone dial. Does anybody know what ones they would be? Here's a classic phone dial. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, R, S. Okay, so we're missing a Q. T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. So Q and Z were missing from the phone dial in the you know original version. Originally, phone dials had these letters because uh, you would remember your your phone number was really just the last four digits, and then the first part of it was your exchange, they called it, because there were switchboards. And so you would call somebody and their exchange was Keystone 5, you know, 2251. And the Keystone was the exchange, and it would be represented on the dial by KE. So KE5, right? So it was originally there for that. Now we use the keypad numbers on our phones for like people make mnemonic devices out of their phone numbers so that you can call you know, the lawyer, you know, get help. <laughs> it would, you know, it's his encoded number. Um, so you don't have to remember the actual numbers. You just have to remember that his phone number is get help. Um, and then we also, of course, were able to start using it for texting. So back in the T9 days. Anyway, uh, what color is the top stripe on the American flag? Red is the top and the bottom. It sort of encloses the flag with red stripes. And in fact, you know, an artist had to come up with that idea that, you know, you would want to enclose the field with a darker color. Um, it makes us stop for a second and go, what color is the top stripe on a flag? How many times have you seen an American flag? I'm going to say a lot. And the fact that we even have a moment's pause shows us that we really just don't pay attention to things like that. How about how many sides are on a typical pencil, like your standard, you know, um, number two Ticonderoga pencil? How many sides would be on that? Six. And most of us kind of know that. We know that they aren't solidly round, like, you know, some that are um, given away as gifts at a fair or something like that. Those might be completely round. But a typical pencil has, we know they're flat on you know, the sides, we know that there are flatnesses, but then we're like, is it six or is it eight? I know it's not four. I don't think it's five. Is it six or eight? Right. And then we have to really think about it. The purpose of the flat side is, of course, so your pencil doesn't just immediately roll off your desk. But anyway. All right. So encoding failure is also known as absent mindedness because you're just not paying attention to the information. It might be because you're distracted. It might be because the information is just not that important. All right, another sin of omission would be retrieval failure. We, this is what in psychology we literally mean by the word forgetting. Like it's in your, you did encode it. You got it into your long-term memory store, but you can't retrieve it back out. So this is what we consider true forgetting. Sometimes retrieval failure is due to what we call transience. So with transience, um, we're talking about information that you've processed, you've practiced, but it's just not enough to convince your brain to keep it. You haven't retrieved it in multiple contexts or you haven't retrieved it multiple times. Um, so your brain's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just treat this like it was a working memory and it's the number of the hotel room where I stayed. And I'm going to go ahead and delete it. This person doesn't seem to be thinking about this anymore. Um, so if we, we look at a person who, let's say, got a 100% on their Spanish test, at the end of their Spanish course. So they knew all the words on the vo Spanish vocabulary test at the end of the class. When you test them again three years later, they're down to about 40% retention. And that stays pretty stable over the next basically 50 years. Um, you see some ups and some downs. I don't know, did they take a trip to Cancun or something? And you know, who knows what caused some of those 
ups and downs overall. But what you basically see is that you lose the majority of those vocabulary words within the first three years of ending the course. That shows you that those words weren't truly fully encoded. They were transiently encoded long enough to do well on an exam, but not long enough to keep, not well enough to keep it throughout, you know, the rest of their lives. So a person who's done really well in Spanish oftentimes has really just a few words that they really know. Uh, my parents spent 25 years living in Mexico after, um, well, I was in graduate school when they moved down there and uh, they sailed their boat down there and lived in a marina and stuff. Um, you know, they were planning on going through the Panama Canal, but they ultimately chickened out and only made it as far as Zihuatanejo in Mexico and then started heading back north. But then they lived there and never brought the boat back or anything. Anyway, we went down to visit them and I hadn't had a Spanish class in, I had done it in college and it, so it had probably been about 10 years since I had um, done, minored in Spanish in college. And so I get down there and I, rec I discovered I had lost some of my vocabulary, right? So I was trying to buy some candles. We were down there at Christmas time and we wanted to get some candles. So I was trying to say candle and I couldn't think of the word. And so I was saying fiero, thinking that was fire, but that's wild. Fiero means wild. I meant to say fuego, which I thought meant strong. So clearly I was all messed up. I was all messed up. So I, I was asking for um, luz, de fiero. So anybody who speaks Spanish knows I just asked for wild lights. And the store clerk was so clever in trying to figure out what the heck I was talking about. They brought me out Christmas lights that blink. I'm like, that's actually now that I realized what I was saying, that was really a good solution to my question. Um, it was it was not what I was going for, but uh, pretty funny. I was trying to say luz de fuego, I guess. I was trying to say lights made of fire. <laughs> I didn't know how to say candle. Um, now I know it's Velas. So I, I learned and now I remember that and that story is a 20 year old story. But I remember the real word now because it was really super embarrassing to not be able to come up with candle. Um, but anyway, it shows that, you know, some of the things that we hold in memory will hold temporarily kind of in support of that theory of working memory, right, that you hold some information transiently. And that, you know, once your brain is convinced that you aren't ever really going to retrieve this again, it goes ahead and lets it go. Um, so it wasn't a fully encoded memory. Sometimes we experience blocking, and this is where um, we are motivated to forget, perhaps. Maybe we don't want this information to come back anymore. Um, so one way that we might be motivated is through the process of what Freud called repression, right? Like maybe the information was painful or embarrassing or, you know, brought up bad feelings. And so we want to just put it out of mind and pretend like it never even happened. So we repress that information. It's still in long-term memory, but we're, exer we're exerting some of our um, cognitive effort to keep it from being retrieved. We're repressing it from retrieval. So you place it into some kind of unconscious storage. You can't access it consciously because you don't want to, uh, but it might resurface through hypnosis or it might um, resurface through dreams. Freud thought that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. So he thought, you know, if you could interpret the symbols that are present in people's dreams, then maybe you could figure out what they're holding in their unconscious. He also thought that hypnosis was a great way to get at the unconscious contents. But what he realized was that it's really hard to hypnotize some people. Some people aren't hypnotizable. So he used dream interpretation. He also used free association as a way to, um, to get people to accidentally reveal what's in their unconscious. What cognitive psychologists often ask is, is this repression or is this inadequate retrieval cues? Like, is it possible that if we gave the person um, the proper cues, it would pull out of their blocked memory store, whatever that is. Freud says it's the unconscious. I'm going to say whatever it is. We're not sure. Um, is it possible with proper cues, we can get a person to retrieve that information out of their blocked area? Um, and so we don't really know. Um, but when, one of the things that we do know for sure is that memories rely on the right stimulus to retrieve them. You know, we talked about that um, when we were talking about retrieval cues, right? That context can serve as a retrieval cue. You know, if you can get the person back in the mindset that they were when they made the memory, whether that's the same mood or that's the same, you know, um, physical context, it's the same um, 
uh, I, I'm trying to think of another word besides like drugs. Cause like if you're really tired or if you're on drugs or you're drunk or something like that, uh, memories will come back to you more easily if you're in that same state again. So maybe we just need the right cues. All right. I'm going to take a break here and I'm going to do this little demonstration with you in the next segment.